Okay, so here we go. We've been in this series of messages on what it means to be called by God, how, how God interrupts our life and does some work inside us and then uh, invites us, calls us, challenges us to step out uh, on a new adventure. And uh, I'm, I'm really struck in the, in the Bible. We've been looking in the Old Testament at some of these uh, characters and how God interrupts them and draws them to a new um, adventure. And um, th th it's different each time. Um, and it's interesting to see that God doesn't have a formula when he, when he works with us. Um, and I know, knowing you all, that uh, formulas don't work with you. So I wish it did. <laughs> Thought I had it figured out once. And then <laughs> realized nothing works here. We've got to just, <laughs> just got to trust God. <laughs> if we had a formula, we wouldn't need the Lord. You know, that's the thing. But, uh, you know, but one of the things, like, like we've, we've looked at uh, Moses, uh, who we think of as someone, you know, very responsive to God's call. But it was, it was Damien who taught me that, that Moses sat there and had five big arguments with God over each, you know, who are you to call God? Who am I? Who are they? What will they think? And I'm disabled. And finally, I don't want to. Can you get someone else? You know, that's, that's Moses' faithful response to God. Here am I. Call someone else, please. And, uh, and today I want us to look at um, uh, Isaiah, the prophet, um, and, and his encounter with, with God and, and how this turns into a call to serve. And I was struck in this that it actually, if there ever was an outline to how God calls us, it, it might be this um, Isaiah um, situation. So it's in uh, Isaiah chapter 6. Um, let me read it with us here. Um, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and exalted and the train of his robe filled the temple and above him were seraphs each with six wings with two wings that covered their faces and two that covered their feet and two that were flying and they were calling one another holy 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 is the lord almighty the whole earth is full of his glory and at the sound of their voices the doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke woe to me i cried i am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand that he'd taken from, with tongs from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth and said, Look, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, go and tell the people, be ever hearing and never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous, make their ears dull, close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So that's the, that's the, uh, encounter that I want us to look at today. So pray with me. Lord Jesus, teach us from your word. Teach us how you uh, come into our lives and how you transform us from within and how you challenge us to go out as your hands and feet and eyes and voice in this world. Uh, give us the courage to, to hear you in a fresh way today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um. I, I need to say this, first of all, you know, I was, I've been a pastor for so long that um, uh, people assume that I had this sense of being called into ministry. You know, you always think that about pastors. And and uh, and people over the years have asked me, so tell me about your call experience, what that was like, that that called you to be a pastor. And I feel so bad because I don't have a good story. Uh, it, it, I never actually felt God called me to be a pastor, which may sound strange since I spent 35 years doing it. But um, uh, I felt really strongly that God called me uh, to follow him. You know, Jesus said, you know, let me come into your life and follow me. And, and basically, I had a sense that um, as I followed him, things were going to happen. People were going to come into my life. Ministry would take place or not. 
Um, but the call for me was, am I going to trust Jesus with my life? Not to some kind of job or career. And actually being a pastor, I kind of backed into, really. It was, uh, um, I was voted least likely to ever be recognized as a pastor at the Denny's, you know. <laughs> and uh, that happens even in church. Uh, but, um, but I felt like the call for me was, are you going to trust me, Jesus asked. Are you going to let me be Lord of your life? And if so, then step out and let's go. And so that's been the call that I've followed, and whether it's in a church or not, uh, has been highly irrelevant in, in some ways. Um, now, the, uh, this passage in Isaiah 6 is, is very specific because it talks about, it's rooted in history, like, you know, on the, uh, the year that King Uzziah died. You all remember that, right? That was a big one, you know. That, but what we have events, um, like yesterday, um, um, B.B. King died, you know. What? Oh, he's on hospice. He didn't, well, okay, no, I, I know he did, you know. <laughs> Okay, well then I'll try another. Ben E. King died this year, this week. <laughs> I can't even get that right. <laughs> but but you all remember those of you who are, who are older, uh, like like me. You remember the day that Aldous Huxley died? What you were doing? And and the day that that uh, C. S. Lewis died. The same day. And the day John Kennedy died. Same day. You remember that, right? Most of you don't because you're so young, but um, <laughs> I remember where I was when I heard that news, you know, and uh, even so long ago. So when so when Isaiah says, you know, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, people go, but that was tangible because King Uzziah had, had reigned for 50 years and it was good years and there was prosperity and the land blossomed and, and people's lives were, were enriched and, and they were they were on a 50 year bull market, basically. Uh, and when he died, it was like, what now? And sometimes it's in those times when, when things change. Whatever's been going stops. Either the bad things stop or the good things stop. And we go, I'm open now to something new. And it was in the year that King Uzziah died, after 50 years of good, good rule in the land. And Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. I am and lifted up. And there's this personal encounter. And I'm going to be high tech here for you. Richard Murray is, is working. He has a plan that we're going to someday make this all really high tech. But for right now, <laughs> bear with me. The, the first part of this call Left-handed, that doesn't make sense. Um, I can't use people who are left-handed. Okay. The first thing is this: this personal encounter with God. This is where it starts. It doesn't start with a dream for ministry or a vision or anything like that. It starts with uh, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I saw God in in majesty and and this encounter with God. That that's really interesting because in this passage. We, we discover two really strong theological points, okay? This is Pastor John talking now. You, you have uh, the transcendence of God, that God is beyond us, is bigger than us, uh, he's, he's not in us, uh, like the kind of New Age thing of, you know, you are God. Uh, God is something other than us, the transcendence of God, but it's also the... what. Uh, uh, scholars say the imminence of God, the closeness, that, that God's very near and close and uh, intimate in our lives and holy and majestic and beyond us. Isn't that strange, that two contrasts? And that's what Isaiah brings here, this, this holy uh, majesty of God, I, I saw that, and then this intimate encounter, and very personal and very... Uh, very relevant in, in his time. And, and so this encounter with God has, has both of those. And, and I think that, that you and I, as we uh, open ourselves up to the Lord, 
uh, need to be looking for and experiencing both the majesty, uh, the power of God, who's way beyond us, and also the incredible intimacy and uh, coming close of God to us and in our situation, whether it's celebrating or grieving, whatever it is, and, and that he's involved in our lives. And in that encounter, great things can happen in us and, and through us. Um, I was talking with a, a person this week, and uh, uh, he, he, he was a physician, um, anesthesiologist, and uh, and he found out I was a pastor, so we, we didn't talk for a long time. And then, <laughs> and, and, and then, and then he, he said, yeah, I just want to, I'm someone who, you know, I'm a science bearing, science background, but I've always had this sense of I wonder if there could be a God out there uh, who cares about me. But then as soon as I start thinking about that, I go, no, 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 you're a science person. And you're, he said, I, I keep flip-flopping. Would it be okay if we met uh, a week or so? Maybe we could talk about some of these things? What should I say? <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I think about that. We all have this, we, we're going to have this encounter. Whether it happens this side of heaven or on the other side, there's going to be this encounter, okay? So I'm just warning you. Uh, and, and we need to be prepared to say, Lord, oh, there you are. Here you are. And, uh, and as soon as Isaiah has this encounter with God in uh, the year that King Uzziah died, something very uh, powerful happened to him that didn't happen with all the other people who were called that we're looking at. And that is this overwhelming awareness, not of, it's not a theological awareness, it's not a, a insight into, uh, uh, you know, potentialities of life, any of those things, you get, what was the awareness? An awareness of Oh man, I'm in trouble. Who am I to stand in front of holy God? And that it was an awareness, and I'm and not and specifically not putting in judgment. It was not a judgment. It was an awareness of I am so not ready for this. And I think that can be one of the most powerful. Uh, transition points in our spiritual life when we come to grips with the fact that we're not ready for meeting the Lord and we're not ready for what God might have for us or what he wants to do through us and we're so not prepared for that now you know the tendency I think you know among a lot of my friends is what we do is we try and spend all our time and energy trying to get ready, get our life in order, make everything work so that if we ever do meet God, we're, we're ready. And it doesn't work at all because we're never ready on our own. And, uh, Isaiah's awareness of, oh man, I'm a man of unclean lips and I'm among a people of unclean lips. I think you should see my family. <laughs> you know, there you go. I just had that last week. <laughs> my, my brother and his wife, my sister and her husband visited us for the first time in my life. And uh, now I know where I come from. Now I know why I'm the way I am. <laughs> and if it weren't for an encounter with God and a miracle, you know, uh, you know, you know, I came from a people with issues, and uh, and I'm a and I'm a man with issues, and so um, that's what it, what it is, and that's what God deals with. And so the the interesting thing though is for Isaiah, this awareness, you think. This should block what God wants to do. This should end the call right here. 
God should say, I'm really sorry. I misunderstood. I thought you were better than this. You had me fooled. So I'll just sneak out of here and find someone else, Isaiah. Right? Because, you know, God's intimidated by our issues. God just doesn't know how to handle us. Oh. You know, uh, it, you know and where did that, uh, that experience was echoed in, uh, in Luke, I think it was chapter five, uh, when, when Jesus calls Peter to, to come follow me, leave your fishing business, leave the family business, come follow me. And what does Peter say? Go away. Get away from me. Because I'm a sinful guy. Everybody in the village knows that. He probably said, my wife knows that. <laughs> and, uh, and ironically, Jesus didn't go away. He stayed right there. No, no, I, I know you. Come follow me. Same thing that Isaiah said. And I think we, we've tried to disqualify ourselves with our issues and our life and our problems and stuff. And God just is so not caring about that. So I can take care of that. If you just admit it, if you would just <laughs> admit it to yourself, I can take care of that. And so we get to this third part of this experience. For Isaiah, it was an experience of, um, of cleansing and forgiveness kind of interwoven in there, wasn't it? Um, God says, oh, I can take care of that. And, um, and so uh, the scripture says that uh, you know, coal from the fire came and t you haven't done cleaning up, so okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, and throughout scripture, that cleansing is often seen as a, a, a in a parallel with fire. It's a burning. It's like uh, like when when gold is uh, uh, being uh, refined, the fire gets hotter and hotter and hotter until it melts. And then all the impurities float to the surface where they're so obvious, you know, and uh, and then they're scraped off and discarded and what's left is the gold. Um, uh, Eileen and I had a pastor when we were young who used to say that at every wedding ceremony as if to imply that the heat would be turned up in our marriages and all the impurities would be obviously floating on the surface, you know. I don't know why he thought that of us, but... Um, <laughs> and the refining process of this fiery thing. and But but that's very biblical, this idea that uh, the heat gets turned up in your life. And when that does, uh, the impurities float to the surface and then, then God has a chance to do this refining in us. And so there was this experience of cleansing and forgiveness that honestly, Isaiah never asked for. He never said, oh, forgive me, Lord, oh, cleanse me, and nothing like that. He just went, wow, whew, look who I am. And, and God said, I'll take care of that. You know, we have a, our, our AA group, Sicker Than Most is the name of the group, uh, meets on Friday nights, and uh, surprisingly young, and witty, <laughs> but uh, you know, one of the things that, that that they're discovering is that the hardest step to take is the one that says, "My life's out of control, and, and I need some some bigger than me to help me here." And um, and that's what Isaiah had to have this experience of grace and forgiveness, and and um, and realizing that it was not something that that he could do for himself. I think before God calls us, he has some work to do in us that says, uh, let me bring some healing into your life so that you can step out and follow me. And, and that experience is so profound and we, and we all stand in need of God saying, I've got some work to do in you. Um, let me do it. 
let me show you show you what I can do. And uh, and then this last one, this uh, this call. And really, it was a call to adventure. It was a call to step out. And, uh, after grace is demonstrated, and after the forgiveness, after the realization of who they are, after this encounter with God, following all of that, the, the questions raised, uh, whom shall I send? Who will go for? And it wasn't an, hey, Isaiah, look at all the work I've done in you. It's about time you get off your cedar and, uh, and step out. I got some things for you. It wasn't like that, was it? It was, it was, Isaiah, who can we send? Now, if this was Moses, it would be send my brother Aaron. <laughs> I got it. He's the one. But with Isaiah, he has this response. Here, I'm here. Send me. What a response. I'm here. Lord, you could send me. Screwed up as I am. You could send me. I think, why is it that it's so difficult to get to this part, this call to adventure, this call to step out and uh, be the, the voice, the eyes, and the mouthpiece and the hands and the feet of, of God himself. How, why is that so difficult? I don't know. For me, I think I'm happy to say, here my Lord, send me, and here's the thing I'd like to be doing, uh, and this is how I'm going to serve you when you send me, and this is what I'm going to do. Of course, I'm not doing any of that, and don't expect me to do that, but Lord, if these Two things can be done. I'll do those, uh, but I'm not going to do that other. And 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 he goes, I'll go get someone else, John. <laughs> you know, really, <laughs> really. But Isaiah's saying is, I don't even know what the message is. I don't know how long this is going to take. I don't know where I'm going to go, what I'm going to do. But I'm here. Might as well send me. I think that is such a transformational moment to realize that the only qualification he had was, I'm here. That was it. I'm here. You want to use me? Now, I believe that everybody is called. I think everybody's called to serve. If you're going to, Jesus says, uh, come, follow me. That's the invitation to call. And, and I want to say, where? Where are we going? Where are we staying? <laughs> Who are we going to be with? No, not them, Lord. I want my own room. You know? and, uh, and the Lord says, that's funny. They asked for that too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So there's a threat here of commonality, yeah. And uh, but but for Isaiah to say, "I'm here," you want to use me? I'm here. What if that were our prayer? What if that were our response to the living God who meets us and cleanses us and forgives us and brings us grace, and then says, "You want an adventure? Go. I'm here. Let's go." There's a, uh, you know, the, the young people. You know, if you notice all the books on vampires and movies. I saw Twilight one Saturday afternoon when I should have been working on a sermon once. And uh, <laughs> uh, the vampire family and everything. And, uh, and, it, and, it, and a daughter, uh, Dallas Willard, who used to be the dean of the School of Philosophy at USC, um, said, you know, how come the church is filled with vampire Christians? And I thought, what is he talking about? Vampire Christians. He goes, yeah, you know, you say, oh, Jesus, I'll have just a little bit of your blood, just for some forgiveness. 
the new life. I'll get, I'll get saved. Just give me a little of your blood, Lord. And then I'll go on with my life, my way. Won't change me, but thank you, Lord, for saving me. You know, oh, a little more. I got in trouble this week. A, a little more of your blood, Lord. Those are vampire Christians. And I don't think that's what we're called to. Because every time we discover God's incredible grace in our life, it's always with an invitation to follow me. You can't separate being saved from our obedience and our, and our uh, discipleship and our mission and all of these. You can't separate those. Although, you know, tr trust me, I've been in church a can you be in church a hell of a long time? <laughs> I don't know, you know, for, for those of you who are watching on TV. <laughs> we'll forget that. Uh, you know, I'm just wondering, because there is such a tendency to say, oh, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving your blood on the cross so that I can live. Thank you for that. Now, if you excuse me, I've got some living to do on my own terms. No wonder we're so ineffective. No wonder our churches seem so hollow and our Christian experience doesn't really transform us or anyone. We're vampires. Living off the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus without the relationship, the call to serve, even the call to follow. I think it's time to say no to vampire Christians within myself. Every time I want to do that, hey, Lord, you saved me, thanks, I'm on the way. Check in with you later. It, no. Jesus saves us for a purpose, and it's his purpose. It's not ours. It's his purpose. And then as we, as we follow him, his priorities start to become our priorities and, and his love starts to become our love and his passion becomes our passion and his strength becomes our strength. We get transformed in it, right? That's how the call is played out. Here am I, send me. What will that look like for you? Do you know? Do you know what this call in your life looks like for you? I think that's what we have to find out. That's pretty important, isn't it? Lord, here am I, send me. Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to be with? What do you want me to say? What do you want me to not say? That's just as important. That transforms us from a gathering group of vampire Christians into a mission force. And that's a big transition. It's a scary one. Um, and I guess our ministries aren't going to look the same. And I guess that uh, the way we do things isn't going to always look the same. But the call to follow Jesus and to serve is going to be so overpowering that we're not the same anymore. There's an amazing freedom in this, isn't there? You notice none of this is about guilt. None of this is about judgment. None of this is about who do you think you are or any of the things that we say to each other. None of that. It's, it's real. And every step of it sets us free.